We're going back to the uh, book of James today. We've got <clears throat> just James 5. And um, we've been through the rest of the book, learned some things. Um, <clears throat> we're finishing up today. And every time you read it, every time you read the book of James, you find interesting and informative things, things that you didn't know about or that you forgot about. You know, that's the way the scriptures are anyway. They're alive, and, and when you need something, it's right there, and it's, it's alive, and it speaks to you. The Word of God speaks to us. But James gives us many, many, script, uh, many um, instructions on the how-tos. You know, I like to know how to do certain things. I know I like to look in the scriptures and, and learn how to live, how to do for the Lord, what the Lord wants me to do. And so James tells us these how-tos in our Christian life. So I want to go over, um, and I know we've had a lot of scripture this morning, but I'm going to read the whole 20 verses because I just think that, that we need to get it all in there. And then I'll, I'll comment just to, uh, on a few of them this morning. But James 5, uh, verse 1 says, Go to now, you rich men. How, uh, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your, rich, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered and the, re and the rust of them shall be a, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you that shall eat your flesh as it were fire. And, and you have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the, of the laborers who have reaped down your fields. Man, hold on. I am not going to do this like this enemy. I am going to read like I always read. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know, when the, when the enemy is fighting, when the enemy is, is trying to aggravate, he'll, he'll do anything he, he can. But we're, gonna, we're just going to do this. Verse 4, I'm going to start with verse 4. It says, Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he, and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one another, uh, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. We've all heard of the patience of Job. Tiffany even brought it out. And have seen the, the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very pitiful. Very pitiful and tender and of tender mercy. Very, very pitiful don't mean what we think when we say pitiful. <clears throat> Verse 12 says, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be let nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Did y'all hear that? Lest ye fall, lest we fall into condemnation. And then he goes on in verse 13. He says, Is any, sick among, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalm, psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passion as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. 
and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the, rain gave, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Before we go any farther, the Lord reminded me that I was supposed to pray for uh, Barbara's brother-in-law and, and her husband, Chuck. She's on her way to take him. No, you're still here. Where'd you go? Okay, all right. You still going to take him to the doctor? Okay, all right. Well, we're going to pray anyway. Barbara, stand up. Because I, I, I meant to, when y'all were up here, to pray for um, your brother-in-law. What is his name? I can't remember. Devin. We're going to pray for Devin and Chuck. Y'all, y'all just put your hands out toward Barbara this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you, Lord. We trust you. We believe God. And Father, you said in your word, we just read it, to call for the elders of the church, Lord. We're calling, Lord, right now to coming together, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Praying, Father God, that you would touch both of these men, Lord, right where they are, God. You know what's going on. You know what's happening, Lord. You know what's happening in their bodies, Lord, right now, in their spirit even, Father God. You know where they are with you. And Lord, we ask you, God, right now through the power of your word and the power of your blood, Lord, that you do a mighty work in their lives, Lord. Even right now, God, bring healing, Father God, in the name of Jesus. You said we're two, Lord. Agree is touching anything. Lord, there's a whole lot more than two in here this morning. Oh, God, and we thank you and we praise your name, Lord. We lift your name up today because we believe, God, that when we call upon you, that you're going to answer, Lord. Because your word says if we'll call upon you in the day of trouble, Lord, you will show us great and mighty things. Lord. Things will change, God. We believe, Lord, that all things are going to be made new in their bodies, God, right now through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. In chapter 5 of James, it starts off and it's talking about the selfish rich people. Selfish rich people. Oppressors who take advantage of other people or take advantage of people. James goes as far as to pronounce judgment on employers that are taking advantage of employees, that are, that are treating employees unjust. And I know that probably every one of us, if you've worked a job in your life, every one of us has been, been treated unjustly at times. Be careful, especially if you're, a, if you're an employer. Be careful because the Lord is saying right here, or James is saying right here, he's, that God pronounces judgment upon us, upon them. We find judgment pronounced also on the, uh, the selfish people in, in Isaiah 3, 14 and 15. It says, The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of His people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye? Now this is the Lord talking. What mean you that you beat my people to pieces and you grind their faces, uh, you grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord of hosts. That would scare me to death. I'd be afraid to be an employer that was, that was not nice and not uh, good. And if I was rich, which I'm not, if I was rich, I would want to be able to help people. Amen. Amen. Y'all don't have to be quiet this morning. God warns us. That he's going to judge people that takes advantage of others. That, that, he's, that people that are in the wrong, they need to, to wake up. That's, that's a, a part of us as Christians is to pray. You know, when somebody treats you wrong at work or, or the, the uh, employer treats you wrong at work, that's where, as a Christian, you're supposed to take it to the Lord. Pray about it. Pray about it. Have somebody else to help you pray about it. We read that, as you go along, we read that uh, food, that costly clothing and jewels were signs of wealth. 
in the Bible times, and, and they still are today if you look at it. Anybody that's, that's uh, 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 got really nice, nice clothes, you know, you know they got money. They, got, they can afford money. All the jewels they can afford, you know, they got their, their rich people. But here James, he, de, he pronounces the judgment. He pronounces destruction on those kind of people. And, and I'm telling you, if you are rich, make sure that you're helping people. Make sure that you're doing for God, that you're giving to, to people to help because that's the main thing. It just, it just seems like to me when I, when I think about this scripture, I think about the, the ones that are so rich that they don't, they don't do anything except for themselves. But there are people out there, like me and Joey watched Dolly Parton, you know, when she was out there on, uh, on the, one of the places in Tennessee, and, and she, was, she was donating a million dollars. And then she had somebody else to come up, and they're going to donate a million dollars. So see, it's things like that. She gives. She's got the money, and she can give. So God is pleased with her. But I'm talking about those that, that hold back and won't, are mean to their employees and, and different things like that. But uh, verse 4 reminds us that the cry, the cries, if you read the, in chapter 5, verse 4, that the cries of those mistreated, they've reached God's ears. They reach his ears. When you're being mistreated, when you're crying, when you're praying, when you're talking to the Lord about somebody mistreating you, whether it's work or whatever, when you're being mistreated, God hears those cries, people. He hears them. I don't, I don't know about y'all, but can I get an amen on that one? Because there's been times in my life that I've been mistreated, and I know every one of us have, but I know with that, without a doubt that God heard my prayer because He helped me through those times. And He'll help you. He'll help, he helps all of His children. He sees and He hears when injustice is done to people. And, and we, we've got to, we, are, we can be assured. We can be assured because he says, Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I will repay. And he tells us that in Deuteronomy 32 and 35. And he also says the same thing in Romans 12 and 19. Then in the scriptures, in, in chapter 5, the focus turns onto the early church, to the church people. And James is telling them, Maintain your patience, people. Maintain your patience while you're going through this suffering, while you're, while you're being, uh, uh, while you're being uh, have cruel treatment against you and, and all the injustice that's coming against you. Hold on. Hold on. Paul mentions also about uh, patient endurance in many, in many scriptures. And, and I put the reference in the, uh, in the um, devotion, I mean not the devotion, but the bulletin today so that you can go back and look at all of them because there's a lot of scriptures and those are just a few where I found that, that it speaks of patient endurance. And we don't like the word patience. None of us likes the word patience. And I'm going to tell you now, like I always say, when we talk about patience, don't pray for patience, just learn patience. If you pray for patience, you're going to get, you're going to get a trial and a half. But if you just learn patience, you say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that I'm learning patience on my own. I don't, I, you know, that's it. just something that I've always said because I had to live it and I had to go through it. And then somebody told me, a pastor told me, said, never pray for patience. <laughs> but I just want y'all to know that. The early church, they lived in great expectation of the coming of the Lord. That was their main thing. That's what they were looking for was the coming of the Lord. And, and that they would, they would be taken out of all this cruelty, all of these things, the unjust treatment that was going on around them and, and, and to them. They were, they were looking for that day when, like we are, like we're looking for to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? Do you want to look at Him face to face, bow before Him and give Him glory and honor and praise? I can't wait. Sometimes I think, Lord, come now. Just come on and get us, Lord. And then I think about those that are not ready. And then I say, oh, Lord, I don't want to say... Wait a little longer, please, Jesus, like that song used to be. Y'all remember that song? Wait a little longer, please, Jesus. There's a few more out there in sin. But if we, if we take that time when it comes on us like that and just begin to pray for them, pray for them, 
Pray that they will hear the voice of God. Pray that they will see with their eyes spiritually what they need to see that will bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all, all looking for that day. It says in, in uh, Titus to, uh, chapter 2, and I, I want y'all to go ahead or go home and read that chapter. It, it's got some good stuff in it. It's really good reading, but I want to read verse uh, thir- 13 and 14. It says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity, from all sin. That's what iniquity is, all sin. And purify unto Him a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I want to be that peculiar people for, for Him, to Him. I want to be peculiar. I want, to know, I want people to know that I, am, that I serve a risen Savior. I want people to know out there that, that I, 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 I trust God and I hold on to Him and I cling to Him and and I pray and I read the Word of God. I want people to understand that that's what it takes and and it's not as hard as as the enemy tries to make people believe that it is. It's not hard to live for the Lord. It's easier to live for the Lord people than it is to live for the devil. I'm telling you, it's a whole lot easier because God takes care of us when all of the storms of life come and we all have storms just like Tiffany said this morning. We have storms that come upon us and and some of them are for the learning but some of them are what the enemy brings on us but I'm telling you we got to serve the Lord that's what we want to do is serve God serve God to the fullest because it's the easiest way to go and, and, and just, just because I say it's the easiest way I don't mean just do it because it's easy because I'm telling you we got to serve God we got to tell people I feel it in my heart I feel it in my spirit we got to tell people about the Lord. We've got to let them know that He is there even in the midst of all of the troubles that they're going through. He is still there because He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will go with you always, even to the end. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. He deserves all the glory and the honor. James goes on in chapter 5 and he says, let me give you an illustration. Consider the farmer. He waits patiently for his crop. He waits for his fruit to grow. He prepares, he's got to prepare the soil. He's got to plant the, the plants or, or the seeds. He, he's got to wait patiently. We don't like waiting. Nobody likes waiting. We are impatient people. We are, this world is impatient. But we've got to learn that, that if we'll just be patient on the Lord, just like, just like the Lord said two weeks ago when, when He said, God is waiting on you to wait on Him. What? Yeah, God is waiting on you to wait on Him. Because when you come to Him, It don't necessarily mean that your prayer is going to be answered right then and there. It can. I've seen them. I've seen them in an instant. I've seen things happen in an instant. And they do happen. But I'm going to tell you, the Lord is waiting for us because He has got a perfect time. Sometimes He has to set things up because some people can be stubborn. Somebody that needs to help you or, or going to give you something, or, or going to say a word to you, and they're sitting over there on the other side of the church, and they're saying, oh God, oh God, I can't, I can't give them that. You don't want me to give them that. That's the devil. I know it is. That's not what, that's not what you want me to do, Lord. Those kind of things. We have to, we have to wait on people sometimes, wait on God, because, because He's trying to get other people to move in the right direction. Even me. There's times, every one of us, every last one of us, every Christian that's in the churches today, that's sitting at home or that's on vacation, wherever they may be, if they're a Christian, they, are, they take their time sometimes because they're afraid. They fear that it's not God when God speaks to you. Let me tell you, when you get that first thought in your mind, Move on it. Move 
on it. Now I'm telling you, God will work things out. Oh, but I don't know how to speak to people. I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know what to say to people. God will, if you will open your mouth, He said, I'll put the words in your mouth. I'll put them in there. If you've put them in your heart. If you've put the word in your heart, He will allow it to come out. He will allow it to come out. Tiffany, I'm all over your devotion this morning. Woo, that's good. But we can, we can see, you can look in the world today. We've been talking about it already this morning, about different things that's going on in the world. But you can see that the devil has waged war upon the Christian more than ever, upon the church more than ever. Many pastors. Many pastors fallen today. Many of them doing things that they should not have done. And it breaks my heart. Because I stand behind this desk and I think what my mama used to say. She said, oh, but for the grace of God, when somebody would mess up, oh, but for the grace of God, Martha, there goes I. The grace of God has got to keep us. The grace of God. And I'm telling you, if you don't pray for pastors or you don't pray for, if you pray for, for your pastor, for me, and you forget to pray for other pastors, add them all. Add them all in there. Put all pastors. Because I'm telling, I'm telling you, it's, it can be hard, even though it's the, the greatest feeling ever. It can still be hard, just like you, every day of your life. You fight the enemy. The enemy will come against you, just like he comes against me, just like he comes against anybody else, just like he comes against these big pastors that have, that have big, gigantic mega churches. It's our responsibility. People, I tell you this all the time. It's our responsibility to pray for all Christians everywhere, and especially now. Because the enemy is coming in so strong. He's, we, have to, we have to pray diligently. We have to, we have to pray against the deceptions. And, and the Lord keeps bringing that scripture, I mean, those, that word up into my, into my spirit, the deceptions that the enemy is trying to place on people, trying to show them things that's really not so. Things that, 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 that they think that if they experience, that'll be the best experience they've ever had. But it'll be the worst because they set God aside to be able to do those things. I think of, of, uh, uh, I think of the, the most hurtful thing to a church is for us to grumble. For us to grumble about one another outside, especially outside the walls of the church. And, and we've all done it. We've all done it. I'm sure we've all done it at one time or another. I remember grumbling about Janie McGraw, my confidant. She became my confidant. I was a teenager. She became my confidant when I got married and had children, and they came back to Decula. But see, we got to, we got to forget about those things, and we got to look to Jesus. And we've got to begin to tell people about Jesus, because the enemy is trying to distract us. Every Christian out there, I have seen different things. I have heard people tell me different things that they're being distracted. And you can see just as plain as day that it's the enemy. The enemy trying to distract you. Trying to get your mind off of the God. The God things in your life. And get your mind on, on the things that are happening. The, the things that are going wrong in your life. And, and making it bigger. James tells us in verse 9, he says, Watch out, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Beware, in other words, he's telling us to beware. Beware the tactics of the devil. 
Beware. Read your word and, and understand that the enemy will come in like a flood. But, you can always add that, but the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against him or will, will pull rank as the Hebrew word means for, for uh, the standard. Just, uh, just He will pull rank on him. Beware. The Lord could return at any moment. We know that. We understand that. That's what we live. We read the Scriptures. We understand that He could come at any moment. And, and, and really, you know, we, we see these pictures. You see that picture back on the, on the wall back there. It's, it's He's knocking. He's at the door. He's, not, he's right there. He's ready to come. He's waiting on the Father to say, Son, go get my children. It's finally time for them to come home. It's finally time. And one day He will do it. But... As we stand, as we wait on Him, then we've got to remember that the Scripture tells us, just like Tiffany said this morning, and I'm not going to read it because she brought it out. It was Ephesians 6, 11 through, uh, or 10 through 18. It's the children of God. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. He's speaking to everyone that's ever said, Lord, forgive me of my sins come into my heart and I'm going to live for you. He's, he's right there. He's standing at the door and He's telling us. Stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand against. That's what Ephesians 6, uh, 10 through 18 is really telling us. Don't give place to the devil. Resist him. Resist him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, the scriptures tell us. The devil uses, let me show, let me show you one thing. The devil uses bait and switch. Bait and switch. That's a deceptive practice is what bait and switch is. He'll make something look really, really, really good. Have you ever been there where you see something and you think, wow, you just are mesmerized by it. Your, your eyes, your mind, everything is, I want that. That's what I want. Got to have it. Got to have it. Those kind of things. The devil will bait and switch you with those kind of things. And he'll make it look good. He'll make it look enticing. He'll make it look desirable. And once you take the bait, once you take that bait, you're hooked. You're hooked. Unless you can recognize really quickly. Unless you've got the spirit of discernment. And, and, and you can recognize really quickly and you say, in the name of Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. If not, you're hooked. You're hooked. Romans 7, 15. And this is, this is the NIV Martha slash Martha version. It says, I don't understand myself. This is Paul talking. And you'll recognize the Scripture. I don't understand myself at all because I really want to do what is right. We all want to do what is right. But I can't. But I can't. I end up doing what I don't want to do. I end up doing what I hate. This is what Paul is telling us. This, the, the enemy will use the, the bait and switch. When it switches on you, then you become deceived. You become, in, in, you're put into bondage, the bondage of sin. And the enemy will use anything he can. He will use anything he can. Any concept that undermines God's truth, any, any concept that, that undermines God's uh, standard, God's position, that is an element that the enemy will use. That is the device of the enemy. And you must know these things. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little, little mouth, what you speak. Oh, be careful, oh, be careful what you say. Because the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful. Little ears, little eyes, little mouth, little feet. Where you go. The enemy will put a stronghold on you. But you must stay prayed up. If you're prayed up, you will, you will, you will be defended by God. You will, be, you, will be, uh, you will have the Word of God to be able to use like Tiffany was talking about this morning. If, and if you're not then the enemy gets a hold of you and he does not turn you loose easy. He does not turn you loose easy. And let me go ahead and tell you while you're sitting here in this service this morning, don't give up on God now. 
Don't give up on God now. I've seen people give up on God. And they're deceived. Deception has taken their minds. And I'm telling you, it's not easy to get it back. We have to pray. We have to fast. We have to trust God. We have to speak the Word of God over them. Over all of them. Whoever they might be, we have to do that. It is up to us. If you've got family members that are deceived and you know it without out. Speak the word over them. When you're around them, speak the word to them. Even if you have to, if you have to, if they get mad at you, speak the word anyway. Let them walk away, but they won't forget the word because the word of God will come, not return void, but it will go out and it will accomplish all that God wants it to accomplish. Amen. That's what his word says. He says that to us. We must speak the truth in love. The enemy holds, holds, us, holds people captive in deception. But, but those strongholds, they can, be, they can be pulled down. They can be pulled down. And it just dawned on me, Tiffany, you was right on point this morning with God. Because here's the scripture again, casting down imagination in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity people. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what we must do. And then we must speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15 says, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto, into Him all, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Don't be deceived by the trickery of the enemy. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth to people. Even if they don't want to hear it, you know, they'll walk away. I've had bus drivers when I was, a, when I was driving the bus in Gwinnett, I had them walk away, and that's okay. I had them to pass by and say, that's that, that's that preacher, that's that pastor, that's that, that's that woman with the, that, that speaks the Bible all the time. Those kind of things. But that's okay. That's okay because one specific one that said that all the time, that passed by my bus, she's one of the best uh, uh, church people that there ever was today. Today. She realized God opened her eyes because why? Because the word was spoken and it didn't return void. There you go. Y'all should give the Lord a hand clap of praise over that one. Because he deserves it. People then and now think that they can add the word, I swear, to their comments. And it will make people believe them quicker, believe what they're saying quicker. I swear. Uh, if, if you want to know the truth with me, and James is talking about it, if you want to know the truth with me, it's, it, it, you know, that tends to make me not, to, not believe quicker when somebody says, I swear. The Bible tells us not to do that. When some, someone uses swear words or, or oaths to, to trick people into doing things, they, they, they trick people into doing things that they really don't want to do by using, by using swear words. Judgment will come, James 5, 12 tells us. He says, you will fall into eternal condemnation. That's what the Word says. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything this morning that the Word's not saying. I'm too afraid to stand up here and tell you something that the Word don't say. I'll tell you it's my thought. It's my opinion. But I'm going to give you the word. James also, he says, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Just say it plainly. Yes, I will or no, I won't. Yes, I can or no, I won't. No, I can't. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the, one of the easiest things to do is, is just say yes or no. I thought I'd get a laugh out of that, but I'm sure I didn't. I didn't hear it. But uh, it, it, it's, it's really not the easiest, but it really is if you think about it. That's what I'm saying this morning. 
Now quickly, I want to get this last part in. James 5, 13. Any among you afflicted, any of you troubled, any of you distressed, any of you worried, any of you irritated, any of you got any, any, any problems like that, you're just stressed to the max. The Bible says, let them pray. Take it to the Lord in prayer. That's what we're supposed to do when we're going through things stressed out and all kinds of things. And it's okay to ask people to pray for you. So would you pray for me this week? You know, those kind of things. That's fine. And then it goes on and it says, Is any sick among you? He says, Let him call for the elders of the church. and Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil or them, her, whichever, with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, or raise them up. And if they've committed sin, they shall be forgiven. We forget about that part at the end. If they've committed sin, the Lord will raise them up, and if they've committed sin, they'll be forgiven. The effectual, fervent prayer, the serious prayer. Effectual prayer, fervent prayer. Serious prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. And then James ends with this letter. And uh, um, he says, if, if anyone errs from the truth of the cross and one converts him or strengthens that person, whichever one you want to put it in, turning them back, turn them back to God. He says, that person saves the soul, saves that soul, and hides a multitude of sin. Hides a massive, a massive amount. A massive amount of sin. Your sins or their sins. It doesn't really say. It doesn't put, uh, if, I'm, if I remember right, it doesn't put a comma at a certain word that would say their sins or all of your sins. But I like to think that it would be all of our sins because he says a multitude of sins. It'll cover a multitude of sins when you have led somebody to, back to the Lord that has went away from God. So walked away, said, I'm not doing this anymore. The enemy has deceived them, put things in their minds, and then you talk to them and you give them words, words from God, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of truth to them. And that word, don't return void. And then they'll turn one day. You can, you, you, can, you can bank on it. I believe it without a shadow of a doubt that one day they will turn to God, turn back to God. And he says right there, that they'll cover, it'll cover a multitude, a massive, I like to say a massive amount of sin. Yours, theirs, whoever. Go in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. Amen. James said, Elijah was subject to like passions. We, and we are. We are too. He prayed earnestly. It said the rain stopped for three and a half years. He prayed again. And the heavens opened up. And the rains came. And the earth brought forth its fruit. And this was what stood out to me. And all of the scriptures in, in chapter 5 stood out to me. It says that Elijah prayed earnestly. Out of everything that we went through this morning, we need to learn how to pray earnestly. We need to learn how to take time with God. If, if you don't, I know most of you do, but if you don't, Learn to take time. Be earnest in your prayer. You know, I had, I had an experience this week, and, and, and y'all know me, I, t I tell you, and I, 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 don't mean, I don't mean anything by it, and I sure don't want to brag because I don't want to have to pay a price to, to God. But when I pray, I, sometimes I just get so overwhelmed with the presence of God because I'm by myself. It's those times that I'm by myself in the morning when after Joey leaves for work. And I get so overwhelmed with the presence of God and I think this is, this is the best time. This is the best time. Sometimes it can be an hour. Sometimes it can be three or four hours. Sometimes it can be more than that. But I, and I don't say that. I'm just saying this as an example. 
But this past week, I was sitting there and, and uh, I began to pray and I prayed. Kenny, I really thought I'd prayed a long time. I really did. I thought I'd prayed and prayed and prayed a really, really long time. And when I looked at the clock to get up, because I was finished, Aaron, I was finished, I thought. I got up, it was 10 minutes. And I said, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I began to feel condemnation. Have you ever felt condemnation? Has the enemy ever, ever made you feel condemnation because you didn't feel like you prayed enough or you, you fasted enough or you read enough or, or, or done something for somebody enough? And the Lord stopped me. And He said, Martha, I can do more in one minute. But it's your heart that I want. You felt like you had been there forever and it was really good and you felt good about that prayer. So to you, some of you, and I know that there's some that, that uh, battle with this because you've told me so. But just remember that it's not about the time, really. I, I spend time because I have to, because I have to stand here before all of you. I have to spend extra time. That's my job. That's what I get paid for from y'all. <laughs> but I'm telling you, you... You just go to the Lord with your heart opened. I don't care if it's an hour. I don't care if it's 10 minutes. God don't care. He just wants to know that it's from your heart. He just wants you to know that He wants to hear from your heart. No matter what the earthly time is. Because God has no time. There is no time with Him. Just here. We're on the time limit. Not, not, not God. He sees your heart. I just, wanted, I just wanted to tell you that this morning. I hadn't planned to tell you uh, about the experience, but I, I want you to know this morning that God hears even your faintest cry. Even your faintest cry. Let's, let's stand. And if you're really, really serious, really serious about getting down to business with God, He knows that. He knows our heart. We think we, that we can out, out, uh, outthink God or outdo God. But see, the Bible says that He knows our thoughts before we even think them. He, he knows what's going to come out of your mouth before you even say it. You think about that. He knows everything, all things. And when we are in trouble, when we're having problems, when we've got things going on in our life, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to work it out. All those people that are suffering today in the mountains and, 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 and in in a. a Georgia and, and what, Tennessee, Alabama, is Alabama in it? Florida. All of those people, all of them that are suffering today. God will make all things new. It, it, won't be, it won't be what they're used to. The old has passed for them. And behold, <laughs> all things are about to be new. All things. And I pray that their hearts are right with God, every one of them. I'm going to open the altar this morning before we leave. If there's anyone that, first and foremost, if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, that's the main thing. Oh God, that's the main thing. Let the Lord in. Let Him come into your heart. Ask Him to come into your heart and to live and live for Him. Live for Him because there's nothing like it. There's such a peace. The burdens are lifted off of our shoulders. Even though we, we, we feel, we go through things, it's still the Lord carries it for us. He carries those burdens. He lifts the load from us. And we're able to just walk in His peace. And today, if you don't have that peace, if things are going 
chaotic, if they're chaotic all around you, just bow your heads right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we come before you. If there's chaos going on around you, I just pray that you just lift your hands to the Lord right where you are and you just say, Lord, I need you to take this. I need you to do something with it, Lord, and make all things new in my life. We need you, Lord, to make all things new, Lord, for us, for these people that are hurting God today, for those that, are, that have heartaches so heavy, God, that they don't even know what to do with them, Lord. Send somebody their way, Lord, that would speak a word, the word of God to them. We know, Lord, that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could even ask or think. We believe, Lord, we stand on your word. And we ask you today, Lord, to make a way. Lord, save souls, Lord, today. Heal, deliver, set free, Lord, by the power of your word and the power of your blood, Lord. We know, God, as we come before you that you will do just that. We believe it, God, and we stand on your word. We're trusting you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.